So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'll first do like a very brief introduction of Platypus. Um, the Platypus Affiliated Society organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s to 30s, new 1960s to 70s, and post-political 90s to 90s left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. So at U Chicago, we have a reading group which meets on Sundays, every Sunday from 12 to 3 p.m. We also have a coffee break which meets every Thursday from, um, from 4 to 5. Um, and we also have the, our monthly publication, Platypus Review, which you can get uh, over there. Um, so the topic of today's teaching is the American Revolution and the left, and the description is as follows. What was the American Revolution? Why did the left once claim 1776 as its own? As its own? What relevance does the founding of the United States have today? This talk will address these questions by exploring the meaning of the revolution for classical Marxism and in world history. So without further ado, I hand it to the speaker, um, James Vaughn. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Uh, as Desmond said, uh, my name is James Vaughn. I teach in the social sciences coll collegiate division here at the university. And today, I'm going to present a teach-in um, on the American Revolution and the left. Um, I'll speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then I'll remain for questions and answers, and I'll stay until everybody's questions are asked, perhaps not answered in a satisfactory way, but at least asked, okay? So um, let me begin. Um, let me address the second part of the teaching first, the American Revolution and the left, the left. Um, Essentially, it was common on the progressive left at the turn of the last century, I mean the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, to insist that there were essentially two phases in the American Revolution. The first phase was a radical revolution from below, a small d democratic revolution that inaugurated in the 1770s and came to the conclusion with the victory over the British Empire in the 1780s and ultimately founded um, very democratic orders, both in the individual 13 states of the United States and in the Articles of Confederation that essentially organized their relations. That phase was understood to be the truly revolutionary or radical or small d democratic phase. Um, the progressive left of the early 20th century uh, essentially claimed that there was then a second phase or a counter-revolutionary phase, um, a phase from, uh, a counter-revolution from above, if you will. That is, um, amidst this period of radical and democratic experimentation in the 1780s, elites throughout the newly independent United States essentially concluded that there was a threat to their interests, their property rights, their economic expansion westward on the continent and overseas. And as such, they decided to take, undertake a coup effectively, uh, what's sometimes called the founder's coup or the framer's coup. Um, most famously, they gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, and there did not pursue what was their original task, which was to reform the Articles of Confederation but rather decided to pursue an altogether new task, which is to abandon the old framework of government for the United States of America, that is the Articles of Confederation, the Confederacy, and replace it with a wholly new framework of government, which came to be known obviously as the Constitution of the United States of America, which gave rise to the federal union that we know and that persists to this day. Um, ultimately, they issued that constitution in the fall of 1787, and it was ratified by enough states to take effect in 1788. And you had the launching of the new national government in 1789. And eventually all the states, including the laggard Rhode Island, joined the Union. That was essentially the story that the progressive elements of the left in the late 19th and early 20th century told themselves about uh, the American Revolution. Now, that story developed essentially as a kind of plot to accompany the transformation of American government in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, towards what the progressive, progressives envisioned as a rule of technocracy, 
from the top and plebiscites or democratic votes from below. Uh, and that was ultimately enshrined in the era from Woodrow Wilson to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that progressive view of the American Revolution became the dominant view um, on the American left. That is that there were these two phases. The first essentially being a radical phase, a revolution from below, stemming from 1770s to the 1780s, and then a conservative phase or a Thermidorian phase, uh, a counter-revolution from above inaugurated with uh, the creation of the Federal Union, uh, which was done with the ratification of the Constitution in 1788. Um, that was a story progressives told in the early 20th century as they sought to change um, the institutions of American government to radically expand uh, the federal government and the bureaucracies that managed and maintained civil society throughout the United States of America. Uh, a second story they told themselves was that uh, effectively the order that was created was a order, a political order founded for a largely agrarian pre-industrial era and with the industrialization and urbanization of the late 19th century, it had become antiquated. So in some sense, there were two sides to the progressive story. One side was that they were undertaking a modernization, a modernization of the American regime. That is, the American regime had been forged in a pre-industrial agricultural age, and they were updating it for a post-Civil War, post-Gilded Age, urbanized and industrialized world. But they also told themselves a second story, which is they were very much restoring to the fore the interests and rights of the common man. The interest and rights of the common man had been asserted with the radical or democratic phase of the American Revolution, but then they had been undermined with the elites that took control in the so-called second or Thermidorian phase of the American Revolution. Um, and so they understood themselves to be creating a bureaucracy, a technocracy, that could manage and maintain civil society that had been thoroughly proletarianized, industrialized, urbanized, uh, but on the other hand, they also understood themselves as serving the interest of the common man against the elites. This was the kind of petty bourgeois progressive narrative that dominated the American left uh, uh, throughout much of the 20th century. Now, there was always a minority position um, on the socialist left, uh, in particular amongst many variants of the Marxist left, which was that the American Revolution had to be taken as a whole that effectively it was a revolution um, in its entirety and it did not have a radical phase at the beginning and a conservative or Thermidorian second phase. Does everybody follow me so far? Okay. And that largely Marxist interpretation of the American Revolution saw the American Revolution as a whole and saw the Constitution of the United States and the unprecedented federal union across the large territorial mass that it had created as really the completion of the revolution. I'm going to repeat that again because it bears repeating. Uh, the Marxist interpretation of the American Revolution or the Marxist interpretation of the American Revolution that I'm talking about here today presented the American Revolution as one from the first stirrings of the colonial American resistance movement against the reforms of the British Empire after the Seven Years' War that began in the 1760s and that then broke out into fully revolutionary turbulence and, and political action in the 1770s. That was one with the later period of the 1780s in which the Constitution was debated, written, and ultimately ratified. And in that Marxist interpretation, which I'm advancing here today, the Constitution was understood as the fulfillment of the American Revolution, not its negation or undermining. All right, it was understood essentially as the permanent institutionalization of the American Revolution, uh, as the permanent institutionalization of replacing revolutionary violence with democratic, peaceable transfer of political power. All right, so moving on from there, what then is this Marxist understanding of the American Revolution? Well, I basically want to talk about Marxism, not in a kind of grab bag sense of every kind of Marxism you've ever heard of, but the kind of classical 
Marxist position as it had existed more or less from the writings of Marx and Engels in the mid to late 19th century, up through and including the memories of that Marxism after uh, the Second World War in certain Trotskyist sects, as well as in the Frankfurt School. All right, so uh, just to give you some key quotes, Marx himself in his letter congratulating Abraham Lincoln on his reelection, which he wrote on behalf of the entire First International, famously referred to the American Revolution as the inauguration of the revolution of the 18th century. That the American Revolution was the place where the revolution of the 18th century first got off the ground, right? That it inaugurated an epoch of revolutions which included many other revolutions such as the French Revolution and other revolts such as the Brabant Revolt in the Austrian Netherlands, such as the patriotic revolts in the uh, Dutch Republic in 1787, such as um, the revolts that took place throughout Europe during the era of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. So Marx famously viewed the American Revolution as the inauguration of the revolution of the 18th century. He also referred to the American Revolution in that same letter congratulating Lincoln on his re-election as the place where the first great democratic republic sprung up, right? The first modern democratic republic had sprung up in the United States. Um, two other quotes, Vladimir Lenin, obviously the most famous of the second international radicals, famously referred to the United States of America as the place where freedom had most extended itself. Again, Lenin in the early 20th century famously referred to the United States of America as the place where freedom had most extended itself. And then later, Theodore Adorno, uh, probably the most famous writer in the Frankfurt School, said that the United States of America was the place where the bourgeois revolution had been most completed, right? Again, Adorno said the United States of America had been where the bourgeois revolution had been most completed. So what is meant by all of this? The place where the first great democratic republic sprang up. The place, United States of America is the place where the first great democratic republic sprang up. The United States of America is the place where freedom had most extended itself. The United States of America is the place where the bourgeois revolution had most completed itself. Well, I wanna basically take those statements and really get at the spirit behind those statements. Right, because there is a spirit behind those statements that's worth talking about extensively. What is the spirit behind those statements? In essence, the argument of those statements is the bourgeois revolution in the classical pre-industrial era, that is before the industrial revolution of the 19th century, achieved its greatest height in colonial British North America with the overthrow of the British Empire and consolidated most thoroughgoing bourgeois society in world history. Now, I do not want to be misunderstood as speaking in nation state terms or a national framework. I'm not claiming that the bourgeois revolution is any way, shape or form right, limited to the United States, uh, that the bourgeois revolution confines itself within the territories of the United States. The bourgeois revolution, okay, is a revolution that is global in scope. And what I'm arguing, what I'm claiming that the bourgeois revolution claim came to greatest fruition in the United States and created the most complete bourgeois society, I am not claiming that the bourgeois revolution is in some way uniquely American, but rather that the bourgeois revolution took greatest hold in the lands of colonial British North America, and that therefore bourgeois society was most complete before its crisis in the early United States of America. But the bourgeois revolution is a global revolution. It does not take place within a national framework. Another way of putting this is that the United States of America is not a country that had a revolution, but rather it's a revolution that has a country. 
There's a very famous expression in the 18th century about the Kingdom of Prussia. The Kingdom of Prussia had the most modern, successful, disciplined military of the 18th century, particularly under King Frederick II, right? Under uh, the whole Hohenzollern monarch in the Kingdom of Prussia, Frederick II, better known as Frederick the Great, the army had been so expanded and so revolutionized and so scientifically perfected that it was a famous expression amongst the Republic of Letters in amongst Enlightenment philosophers in Europe that Prussia was not a country with an army, but an army with a country. And so I want to take that adage and really apply it to the United States as borne out by the American Revolution. That is, the United States is not a country that had a revolution. Rather, it's where the bourgeois revolution, the revolution of modern society, most effectively took hold of a country. So what do I mean? What does classical Marxism mean by this? That the United States is not a country that had a revolution, but rather a country where the bourgeois revolution, the revolution of modern society, most clearly took hold. Well, to better understand this, we have to turn to this term here. And you'll excuse my German pronunciation. I'm a German reader, but not a German speaker. Can people see that? This is Bürgerliche Gesellschaft. And I'm really slaughtering this, right? I apologize, but this is Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, translated as bourgeois society. The category of bourgeois society is of fundamental importance for classical Marxism. It is one of the most fundamentally important categories of classical Marxism. Classical Marxism inherits it from previous traditions of writing, Enlightenment, Whig, liberal traditions of writing in the 17th and 18th century. Above all, classical Marxism inherits it from Hegel, the culmination of German idealism in the writings of Hegel. But right, classical Marxism inherits this concept, but also in inheriting this concept and seeking to preserve this concept, transforms this concept importantly. So what does Bürgerliche Gesellschaft mean? It means, it's a, it's a much better term in German than in English because it means simultaneously both bourgeois society and civil society, all right? So let me try and talk about effectively where this term comes from. During the Middle Ages, serfs who escaped their bondage, serfdom after all was a kind of unfree labor, a quasi-slavery that tied people to the land that they were born on, that tied people to the dominion or the airshaft, the power that the local lord had over them. Um, serfs escaped and went into the towns or cities. And there was a very famous expression in uh, the medieval Holy Roman Empire, medieval Germany, Stadtluft macht frei, town air makes a man free. The idea is you escape serfdom, you escape being tied to the land, you escape being tied to the isolated backwater, you escape being tied to the power, the dominion of the feudal lord, and you go and you live in the town where you try and freely eke out of your existence. Now, it's of course the case that the existence of the burger, the, the medieval town dweller, a burg is just the term for medieval town. And so a burger is simply a medieval town dweller, right? More, co more commonly known as bourgeois, right, in French. Simply a burger, a town dweller, all right? But that kind of experience of the burger, of the town dweller, was very, very limited in the Middle Ages, right? A escape serf or a town dweller, someone who had the freedom of the town or the city, whether it was Hamburg or London or Rotterdam or Lyon or Venice or Vienna, um, nevertheless was with, with, within certain corporate rights, chartered rights, guild privileges that controlled many aspects of their existence. All right, but effectively that term, that term burger, became seen as really signifying a, a freedom that became much more generalized in the early modern era. And I'm gonna get more into that in a moment, but let's leave that aside for the time being, okay? Um, so 
This term Burgerliche Gesellschaft means both bourgeois society and civil society. And it's such an important term for Marxism because essentially it is both, uh, it contains the original Hegelian meaning, but also has within it a specific meaning for class classical Marxism. What was the Hegelian meaning of Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, a bourgeois society? Well, to really understand that, we have to understand where this term civil society comes from, okay? Civil society came to the West, came to Europe and North America, that term effectively from the Roman world. It's a Latin term which derives from an ancient Greek term. Most famously, one can see the ancient, that is the ancient Greco-Roman concept of civil society in Aristotle's politics, where he uses that category. But for Aristotle and for the ancients in general, civil society meant political society. It meant organized society. It meant a society that was not simply a free for all of men and women living together in the world, but they had organized right, themselves, and effectively, they had laws, institutions, practices with coercive power that flowed from some central political authority uh, and that, that kept the population together as a whole. And for Aristotle, and really for the ancients, and one can see this right through Aristotle up to the likes of Cato, Cicero, and the ancient Roman world, right, civil society is political society. It's organized society. And the highest purpose of civil society is participating in political life. Being a member, right, of the assembly of ancient Athens, being a pater familius, a male head of household in ancient Athens that comes into the assembly and votes by majority and determines the laws that everyone lives by. And those laws regulate the whole of life, war and peace, rituals and rites, commerce, trade, religion, worship, music, entertainment, right? Remember, Socrates is put to death for violating those laws, right? For corrupting the youth of Athens and for teaching what they thought were against the gods of the city, which the assembly of Athens regulated, right? And they were able to vote Socrates by majority in trial to death, right? The second most famous trial in the history of Western civilization. The first, of course, being OJ. No, no, okay, okay. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. I paid Desmond to laugh at that. So anyway, all of that, all of that being said, um, that political life and for Cicero and Cato, coming into the Roman Senate, right, being a tribune, being a member of political life was the highest form of life. That was civil society, okay? And effectively, we then go into the early modern world. By the early modern world, I'm talking about that period following the thousand years of the Middle Ages, roughly in 1500, the beginning of the 16th century, going up to the time of Hegel, which we'll call 1800, the dawn of the 19th century. So effectively, that concept of civil society, the ancient concept, which you can go right back and read, its most perfect expression is in Aristotle's politics, but also in the speeches of Cicero, Cato the Elder, etc. That concept of civil society was dominant in the pre-modern world, the world of classical antiquity, and then the European Middle Ages, the medieval Christian civilization that followed afterward, okay, roughly until 1500. So what happened in 1500 to shake that concept of civil society? Well, effectively, this is not a history lecture, so I have to be extremely crude in summary, right? But a number of developments took place in the 16th and 17th century, the 1500s and 1600s, that really um, began to shake the foundations of intellectual and cultural life in the West. And with shaking those foundations, we got a, a, a transformation of the meaning of this term civil society. So very quickly, what are those events? Well, prior to 1500, in the 14th and 15th centuries, west of the river, river, river Elba, um, effectively serfdom collapsed in Europe. So broadly, what we consider Western Europe from roughly 
the west of Germany, west today, serfdom collapsed everywhere. Feudalism went into a profound crisis, serfdom collapsed, and by roughly 1500, servile labor, unfree labor, was increasingly a thing of the past in the west of Europe. And that saw the collapse of feudalism and serfdom. By 1500, there had developed in the towns and cities of um, uh, Western Europe, where a lot of free laborers were moving from the countryside to, again, these newly free laborers being freed from serfdom, feudalism in the 14th and 15th centuries, moving into the towns and cities of late medieval Europe, those towns and cities had experienced a whole efflorescence of social, of economic, of cultural and intellectual life, and eventually gave rise to the Renaissance, right? Which is simply a French term for rebirth or renewal. Right? And it was really in the Renaissance and the kind of rediscovery of Greco-Roman civilization and categories like civil society that people really began to rethink all of the intellectual and cultural foundations of European history. This is really the first flush of bourgeois society in the Marxist sense, if you will. Okay? Then moving on from there, around 1500, we essentially get the inauguration of the age of discovery, the age of exploration, right? You get in 1486, 1487, the Portuguese round the southern tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, and they essentially establish the maritime passage between Europe and Asia, which means that the lands of the old world, which Europeans call the old world, the world of the Roman Empire, the unknown parts beyond it, the lands of the old world, Europe, Africa, and Asia are gonna become much more closely tied together because of this discovery of a direct maritime passage between Europe and Asia. That creates really a new world within the old world of an increasingly interconnected Europe, Africa, and Asia. A few years later, Columbus set sail to try and reach Asia, not by the South Atlantic around the southern tip of Africa, by, but by a westward voyage and happens upon Hispaniola, today's uh, Haiti and, 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 and Dominican Republic. And other explorers and conquerors, conquistadors, colonizers follow in Columbus's wake, and eventually you get uh, uh, Amerigo Vespucci, the Italian explorer in the early 16th century, theorizes this as a whole new continent, the Americas, right? And you have a whole new world that's discovered, the Americas. And with the colonization of the Americas and a lot of the labor force used in the colonization of the Americas, that is enslaved West Africans, you have a whole new Atlantic world being created as Western Europeans, West Africans, and indigenous people come together to form new societies in the Americas. And that's a new Atlantic world, which indeed also through the great expanse of commerce, of trade, of manufacturing, of finance, redacts back upon the old world of Europe and transforms it even further. All right, so as these two new worlds, the worlds created by the Portuguese rounding the southern tip of Africa, the worlds created by Columbus's discovery, as they emerge and tie the world together, this is creating even further transformations in Europe. These sites of free labor, right? In Western Europe, the whole countryside is basically free labor and people are moving into towns and cities and you have the efflorescence of the Renaissance. And with these two great new worlds being formed, you effectively have a massive increase in the world market. You have not an increase in the world market, but rather the creation of the world market, the creation of a global division of labor. And that's gonna massively increase trade and commerce and manufacturing and finance within Western Europe itself, okay? And that's why as bourgeois relations, that is the relations constituted by free labor, by the free trade above all of one's own labor as property with others, bourgeois social relations emerge because of these global transformations but their heartlands, where they most thoroughly develop, is obviously against the background of 
late medieval feudal dissolution and decay in Western Europe, right? These bourgeois social relations, these social relations based on free labor, on the exchange of labor and its products as private property by free individuals, that emerges because of global reasons but takes its fullest expression in Western Europe. And beyond these transformations, you get, of course, the Reformation. And with the Protestant Reformation, you get the breakup of Western Christendom, of Latin Christendom, of the Roman Catholic Church. And you have the setting of a period of religious warfare and all of that. And all of these upheavals ultimately cause a profound crisis. By the early 17th century, there is an absolutely profound crisis across the Western world. And it's a crisis of intellectual authority, of political authority, of cultural authority, etc. People, because of the transformations that have taken place, the end of the Middle Ages, the development of the Renaissance, the discovery and creation of these new worlds, the reformation and the break of Western Christendom, all the old traditions of medieval Europe, cultural and intellectual, are no longer plausible to most people. And as a result, you have a whole new searching for a new certain basis for essentially understanding the world for human beings living in Western Europe and their colonies overseas, trying to understand the natural world around them, nature, trying to understand their innermost selves, their subjectivity, their consciousness, and trying to understand their relations with others, okay? And effectively, right, Again, I want to repeat that because it bears worth repeating. You have a total transformation of how humans understand themselves in the world, right? By the early 17th century, the men and women living in Western Europe are trying to understand their relations to nature. That ultimately gives rise to what's known as the scientific revolution, right? The series of developments that inaugurate earlier with Copernicus, but really take their full form between Galileo in the early 17th century and Newton at the end of the 17th century. That's about rethinking the relationship of humanity to nature. And then the developments that come into full fruition with Descartes in the 1630s and 40s, which is rethinking our relationship to our innermost self, right? That is our consciousness, our self-consciousness, our self-awareness, right? I think, therefore, I am, okay? And ultimately, thinking through the relations we have to one another the relations we have men and women amongst each other living together in the world. Scientific revolution is about thinking through our relations with nature. Descartes and the inauguration of modern Western philosophy is about thinking through our relations to our innermost selves. And there's a whole other branch of thought that develops that will basically be known as social contract theory and liberalism that is about thinking about our relations with one another. And the most famous practitioner of this new branch of thought, of social contract theory, the first great practitioner is Thomas Hobbes. Now, Thomas Hobbes recovers this classical category of civil society in his major work, Leviathan. But in this major work, Leviathan, when Thomas Hobbes recovers civil society, he talks about civil society in the way that the pre-moderns did, meaning he talks about civil society as essentially organized society, society given a political shape, a political form. But ultimately, there's a second concept which creeps in. For Hobbes asserts, ultimately, that when men and women live together in the world peaceably and successfully, right, they essentially bring into something, they bring into being something much greater than themselves. They bring into being a power that is much greater than the sum of its parts. As Hobbes says, there is no society in the state of nature, but once people are peaceably and successfully organized, there is society, and society is radically transformative. But according to Hobbes, you need a Leviathan, an absolute sovereign power, in order to be able to pacify a given territory and to allow human relations to take place peaceably and successfully. There has to be an all-powerful Leviathan, an absolute sovereign, 
in order for relations to take place peaceably and successfully. But once that's done, there will be society. And for Hobbes, society doesn't have any necessary particular ethnic or cultural or traditional or religious character. It's just people in the relations of their daily life freely associating and interacting with one another to pursue their own ends, to pursue uh, the course of their own existence and to freely cooperate with others to pursue the course of their own existence. Now, Hobbes is the great defender of absolute sovereign power. And in that sense, Hobbes is speaking to his age, which is an age of absolute monarchy. And it's absolute monarchy, the kind of new monarchies that develop in Europe in the 16th and 17th century that basically are able to pacify their territories, to put down bastard feudal magnates, to put to the sword feudal lords that resist, to regulate currencies, to regulate trade, to destroy tariffs and barriers and customs, to create unified economies and societies. It's absolute monarchies that create pacified realms and allow the free relations of daily life in bourgeois society to begin to emerge. All right, and so there's some reason why Hobbes argues that an absolute sovereign power is necessary for society, for the free relations of daily life, all right? Now, what should be clear here is that Hobbes is both inheriting the category of civil society and still keeping its pre-modern meaning, which is organized society, right? Political society, but is already tending towards its other meaning, which is a free relations of daily life that is the primary site of human existence in the world, right? Hobbes is beginning to separate the political and the social. Moving on, later in the 17th century, the next great thinker in the social contract tradition is, of course, John Locke. And John Locke is, unlike Thomas Hobbes, not a thinker of civil war and political crisis in which the world is falling apart and Hobbes is justifying an absolute sovereign power to put it back together again. John Locke, rather, is the thinker of the late 17th century, of the glorious revolution in England of 1688, 1689, and of the early Enlightenment. John Locke is the thinker of really civil society or society come into its own. And it's really under John Locke that we begin to see Hobbes's transformation of the category civil society really come into its own. Because for Locke, the state of nature is not like Hobbes, a war of all against all in which there is no society, but rather the state of nature is thick with social relations. Without coercive power, without a monopoly of violence, Locke thinks that human beings can to an important degree peaceably assemble, associate, work with one another to bring about something much greater than themselves. Already for Locke, the social is constituted in the state of nature prior to the creation of the political, the civil society, the political society. So for Locke, the social is being constituted in the state of nature, and it's only because people cannot be judges in their own cause, effectively, that they can't enjoy the state of nature fully. So they choose right, to exit the state of nature by creating a social compact and by creating an organized or political society that does not create an absolute sovereign power, a leviathan that is unaccountable, but rather creates an empire of law, a rule of law, to which everyone is accountable, including the political power that is put in place. For Locke characterizes that political power not as leviathan, but as judge, referee, universal umpire. Why? Because unlike Hobbes, Locke does not have an absolute sovereign power unaccountable put in place in order to create the social. Rather, Locke claims we've already created the social and to better enjoy it, we create the political, the empire not of Leviathan but of the law. And there is nothing that is unaccountable to the law. Everyone is accountable to the law, including the lawgiver. And the lawgiver is not Leviathan, but is arbiter, referee, judge, umpire. And that concept essentially goes beyond Hobbes 
to really further separate the social and political and to begin to give civil society its enlightenment connotation. That is to say, Locke still has the old language, the classical pre-modern language of civil society being the transformation, the creation of an organized political society. But he also has the concept of the social pre-existing the political and the political being put in place simply to enjoy better the social existence, society, okay? Finally, in this social contract tradition, you have Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who recognizes, right, this category of society and civil society even more thoroughly than Locke does. It's really in the thinking of Jean-Jacques Rousseau particularly in his second discourse, the Discourse on Inequality, and in the social contract, these writings of the high enlightenment of the 1750s and 1760s, that these categories of the social, of society, of civil society come into their own. And the concept becomes that human beings are essentially free, right? They are not simply animals that operate according to instinct but rather they have a capacity that is known as spirit, a capacity of free will, the ability to say no to nature. And flowing from this capacity is another capacity, perfectibility, adaptability, mutability, the ability to transform the world around themselves and in turn to transform themselves, to create another nature beyond their original nature, animal nature. And According to Rousseau, it's in social interaction, social congress, social intercourse with others that these human capacities of self-consciousness, self-awareness, freedom, spirit, perfectibility are radically prompted, expanded, and developed. Again, it's through social interaction, social congress, social intercourse that these human capacities of spirit, self-consciousness, self-awareness, freedom, perfectibility are radically expanded and developed. And we do not simply, right, have a single state of nature, but rather we have a nature that is basically fundamentally one of freedom and mutability. In other words, our nature is to transform ourselves. And where that process of collective and individual transformation takes place is in society, through the institutions and practices that we put in place. And for Rousseau, right, the social, the institutions and practices that we put in place to organize our living together in the world is completely prior to the political. And the political is completely subject to them. And if the political order that, that, that is inadequate to the purposes of maximal collective and individual human freedom, then the political order must be transformed. If the social and institutions and practices we put in place, if the social order, the society we put in place oppresses, exploits, enslaves, dominates us, then we must reform, revolutionize, transform, up, transform it so as to maximize our potential for collective social and individual human freedom. Now, the category of civil society has undergone a radical transformation here. Because in this movement of social contract theory of liberalism, from Hobbes to Locke to Rousseau, we really have the assertion not of the political as the fundamental site of humanity, but rather as the social, as the fundamental site of humanity. And it's our being social, our free, daily, our, our free relations of daily life together in the world that is the site of our humanity. And in that sense, unlike the traditional classical category of civil society, the category of Greco-Roman antiquity, which claimed that humanity fulfills its purpose in political life, and therefore there's really only one purpose, there's one definite shape or form of humanity, and it has a political end realized in the Republic or the Assembly and in virtue Rather, this tradition claims that the ends of humanity are various and potentially infinite. There are infinitely various ways to be human in the world, right? And we will work that out and figure that out 
on our own in society, right? In the societies that we form and we create political orders to further. And so you've had a transformation of this concept of civil society such that it no longer is about the priority of the political over the social, but actually the reverse, the priority of the social over the political. And that reversal is the undoing of an idea that there should only be one end of human existence that can be achieved in only one proper ordering of social and political life, but rather that there can be many, many different various ends of human existence, that being human in the world is infinitely various and infinitely changeable, that there are many different ways of being human in the world. And finally, this category has its full realization with Hegel in 1800. And it's really with Hegel that civil society no longer means the classical category, but it now means what Marxism inherited, this term Bürgerliche Gesellschaft. Hegel famously says across many of his works, but most famously in the philosophy of right, that the modern world is divided into three parts, the family, the world of the oikos, the family, the private life of the domestic household, the state, the public life based on coercion, the laws, and then that in between, civil society, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, the area where we've left the private household, we're out in public with each other, like the state, but it is not coercive. It's based on free, voluntary association and consent. And it's in that world, according to Hegel and his fellow traveler of the French Revolutionary and Restoration period, Benjamin Constant, it's in that world of civil society, of civil freedom, where we freely associate, we freely cooperate, we freely assemble, we freely discuss, we freely debate, that's the world where we realize or we come together, not to realize so much as to figure out the course of our existence individually and collectively, to set the course of our own individual human existence and collectively to set the course of our existence together. And that concept of civil society, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, is inherited by Marxism from Hegel. Now, there's a second meaning to Bürgerliche Gesellschaft in Marxism. And that is not simply civil society, but its other meaning in German, bourgeois society. For Marxism, bourgeois society is not the society of the bourgeoisie. Rather, it is the society of the bourgeois epoch that leads to the creation of the bourgeoisie. Again, I want to repeat that. For classical Marxism, bourgeois society is not the society of the bourgeoisie, but the society of the bourgeois epoch that leads to the creation of the bourgeoisie. And for classical Marxism, it was the rise of bourgeois society, the rise of the commodity, the commodity form of the exchange of labor and its products, the rise of free labor and its products as private property freely exchanged with others that essentially right, gave rise to the world of civil society. Now, I realize uh, I have gone I have gone to where I was supposed to in the full time, but I still have about a third of the left of the talk to give where I bring it back to the American situation. Would anybody mind if I trespassed? Again, I will stay as long as you would like me to for the question and answer here, okay? So what does any of this have to do with the American Revolution? Well, I want to go way back to the beginning of the talk, way back to the beginning of the talk, okay? Remember, for Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, the American Revolution was the inauguration of the revolution of the 18th century. The United States of America was where the first great democratic republic sprung up. For Vladimir Lenin, it was the land where freedom was most complete. For Theodore Adorno, the United States of America was the land where bourgeois, the bourgeois revolution was most complete. And what I am trying to say, the meaning of all of that is collectively is that the United States is not a country that had a revolution, 
but a country where the, a re the revolution most completely took hold. In other words, the United States is not a country with a revolution, but is a revolution with a country. So let me explain that in further details. As um, you had this transformation of the classical concept of civil society to the modern concept of civil society, what we can see through the work of Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and achieving its height in Hegel, all right? That idea of civil society practically worked itself out most clearly in the English slash British colonies of colonial North America. Again, that idea of civil society transformed from its classical concept through Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, up to Hegel and its modern concept, took practical purchase in the world, most clearly in the English slash British colonies of North America. Again, I'm not going to get into some huge history lesson here, but needless to say, um, for various reasons, the English are, are not able to get what every European conqueror and colonizer and settler wanted in the 16th and 17th century. They are not able to get control of one of the great indigenous empires of America. They are not able to conquer the Aztecs in Mexico. They are not able to conquer the Incas in Peru, right? By the time the English and other Northern Europeans show up, right, the Portuguese, the Spanish have all the great pickings of the Americas. The English essentially have to settle the Eastern seaboard of North America. And uh, the, the would-be English conquistadors, uh, like Walter Raleigh and others, cannot right, basically find a great indigenous civilization there because they're dealing mostly with primitive agriculturalists and nomadic hunter-gatherers, right? They cannot find a great civilization there to conquer and rule over. Um, likewise, uh, the English mercantile companies that try and control that land and monopolize it can't really find any key crops or commodities they can develop very quickly or they can purchase very quickly to monopolize. So effectively, those English settlements of North America are free from top-down military bureaucratic vice royalties that were established by Europeans in lands they conquered. And they were also free of kind of monopoly joint stock companies that were able to quickly set up shop and claim prize commodities. What happened there was that beyond the slave plantations of the English settlements of North America, there flourished, right, in the, the, the settlements of English North America, lands populated from the beginning by free labor, meaning there was no long medieval background. There was not a thousand years of medieval history like there was in Western Europe. There was not even a couple of hundred years of the crisis of feudalism and the decline and fall of serfdom. Rather, in the English colonial settlements beyond the slave plantations, you had free labor, you had bourgeois social relations put in place from the beginning. That is the commodity form of labor, of, sorry, the commodity form of the exchange of labor and its products had put, been put in place since the very beginning. And it was transforming those colonial settlements such that they were relatively backward colonial settlements by European standards in the early 17th century but by the eve of the American Revolution, by the 1750s and 1760s, the population and economic growth, the demographic and socioeconomic growth of colonial British North America had been greater than anywhere else in human history. Bourgeois social relations, the social relations of free labor, of the exchange of free labor and its products, had developed so thoroughly in the English colonial settlements or the British colonial settlements of North America that the population of British North America had boomed from under 200,000 in the uh, uh, 1700 to over 2 million, closing in on 3 million by the time of the American Revolution. This has been the greatest demographic and socioeconomic increase ever seen in human history prior to, prior to the Industrial Revolution. All right. Now, I want to stress here we tend to think of the kind of society that came into being in Western Europe, 
uh, the kind of bourgeois society that came into being as simply the freeing of the individual, right? As simply, uh, uh, very famously, one of Nietzsche's con one of Nietzsche's kind of contemporaries and mentors, not direct mentor, but indirect mentor, the Swiss German historian Jakob Burkhardt famously referred to the Renaissance as producing the firstborn sons of the modern world. And when he said that, he talked about all of the medieval world, the caste structure, the guild structure, melting away and the modern free individual, the self-possessed, self-owning, free, self-determining, property making, property exchanging individual coming into their own. That of course is true. The story of the rise of bourgeois relations is as Jacob Burkhardt said in the mid 19th century, the story of the emergence of the free autonomous individual. But it is also according to classical Marxism, the story of the emergence of social and collective freedom. The rise of bourgeois social relations did not simply the entail, did not simply entail the emergence of the individual from coercive, unfree, caste, labor, guild, corporate, kinship bonds. It also entailed the emergence of society as such. That is social relations as such between people, right? The relations of people with the natural world around them, with their innermost selves and with each other. That was freed. As bourgeois social relations arose, and as people were not simply free and self-determining, but were increasingly cooperating and interacting with one another and bringing into being a social world beyond that created a sum, or sorry, that created a whole that was much greater than the sum of its parts, a new thing came into existence, society. That was what classical Marxism meant by bourgeois society, the society of the bourgeois epoch. Not the society of the bourgeoisie, but the society of the bourgeois epoch, the society of bourgeois social relations, the society of the free, sorry, the society of the exchange of free labor and its products. That is what was meant. And those bourgeois social relations, that bourgeois society developed most thoroughly in colonial British North America. And it was in colonial British North America that you did not just have freer individuals freely cooperating, exchanging, volunteer, sorry, free individuals, but even more importantly, far greater degrees of collective and social freedom than anywhere else in the Western world, indeed anywhere else in the whole world in the 18th century, right? Meaning these free individuals were freely associating cooperating, interacting in Congress with one another. They were in a free society that created far more wealth and resources, that created far more dynamics, culture, entertainment, knowledge than could be created on one's own, right? And so there really emerged uh, in bourgeois, in the terms of bourgeois social relations on the eve of the American Revolution, not simply the society with the freest in individuals, but the freest society, the greatest social freedom and the greatest individual freedom. And what therefore happened? What triggered the American Revolution? Well, essentially, again, for the third and final time tonight, I will say this is not a history class, but just to be very summary, after the Seven Years' War, the great world war between Whig Britain and Bourbon France, which Britain won decisively, British ministers and officials decided to introduce a number of imperial reforms. And those imperial reforms essentially would have created bureaucratic and military structures in colonial North America that were in no way accountable to the society over which they ruled. Rather, they were solely accountable to the crown and to the parliament back in Britain. And the crown is, of course, a hereditary, unelected dynastic monarch, King George III, and the parliament is, for the most part, a hereditary landed elite. The House of Lords is dominated by a titled aristocracy that passed their seats in the House of Lords onto their firstborn son. And the House of Commons is a landed elite, the common nobility, the gentry, electing amongst themselves the landed members of parliament. So effectively, the imperial reforms would have left colonial British North America subject 
to bureaucratic and military structures, a 10,000 man, a 10,000 man strong standing army of British redcoats, plus tax collectors, customs collectors, judges, inspectors, a bureaucracy that were not accountable to colonial society, but accountable to the British crown and parliament, meaning accountable to the British landed oligarchy. And the way they were justifying this was parliamentary sovereignty, absolute parliamentary sovereignty. They said that parliament had absolute sovereignty over the British empire and that therefore parliament, a majority of parliament could do whatever it wanted because British liberty, British freedom was co-equal, was coterminous with the absolute sovereignty of parliament. And so basically colonial Americans thought they were living in a world of Locke where the political existed only to serve the better enjoyable the peaceable, enjoyable, with you will, of the social, and the world of Rousseau, where the political existed only to serve collective and individual freedom in society. I want to repeat that again because it bears repeating. They thought they lived, colonial Americans, in a world of Locke and Rousseau. I'm talking about the leaders of the radical colonial American resistance movement in the 1760s and 70s thought they lived in a world of Locke and Rousseau where the political existed solely to allow, in Locke's terms, for the better and more peaceable enjoyment of the social, or in Rousseau's term, for the full enjoyment of individual and collective freedom and transformation in the social. But instead, what they found out is they still lived in the world of Hobbes. And remember, Hobbes said, to have the social, you needed the political the absolute sovereign power, which was above the social and unaccountable to the social. You needed an absolute sovereign parliament. And they launched their war, that is the American independence movement, against these claims, right? These bureaucratic, in, in practical terms, they launched the American independence movement, the American revolution against the bureaucratic and military structures that British ministers and officials were trying to put in place that were going to be unaccountable to colonial civil society, that were not going to rule through the colonial assemblies and the wide colonial electorates that allowed for a great deal of political and social power to the colonists. And they were rebelling ideally or theoretically against the absolute sovereign power, the Leviathan of the unreformed and unrepresented British Parliament that said that it was unaccountable to the colonial society. So they were rebelling practically against unaccountable bureaucracy and, and military rule, and they were rebelling ideally against the Hobbesian absolute sovereign power of an unaccountable absolute parliament, right? In the name of fulfilling the Lockean, the Rousseauian, the modern project of freedom, which was the freedom of modern society or bourgeois society, the freedom of society as such, right? Because for the tradition of the radical enlightenment that was inaugurated by Rousseau, but continued up through the French revolutionary period, for the tradition of German idealism from Kant to Hegel, and inherited by classical Marxism is that it is with the radical enlightenment of the 1750s and 60s that bourgeois society comes into full consciousness of itself. It's in the 1750s and 60s that bourgeois society becomes aware of itself, that society becomes aware of itself as such. All right, I, I, now just to conclude, I wanna unpack this a bit. Right, because it is with the radical enlightenment, with Rousseau and what follows after Rousseau, up through the radical enlightenment, German idealism, up through Hegel, that society becomes aware of itself, right? Society becomes aware of itself in the sense that men and women in the Western world, right? Initially in the reading public, through the Republic of Letters and these Enlightenment texts that are being produced, right? Those men and women writing those Enlightenment texts are trying to raise the consciousness, the idea that people, that the true ground of humanity, 
that, if you will, the fundamental ontological existence of humanity is not divinity, is not biological nature, is not the gods, a world beyond us, the, the Augustinian city of God, or the platonic realm of forms. Rather, the ontological ground of our existence is society, are the collective institutions and practices that we put in place to organize our living together in the world and that make possible our ongoing transformation in the world. Again, I'm sorry to trespass on your uh, 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 tolerance. Um, I, I thank you for your patience. But it is really the achievement of the radical enlightenment, the post-Rousseau and the enlightenment, in which society becomes aware of, our, of itself, right? That is that human beings, starting with enlightenment philosophers in the Republic of Letters, raising to public consciousness and spreading out beyond that, that human beings become aware that the fundamental ground of their existence is not right, the ideal world of Plato's forms, is not right, the heavenly city, is not Augustine's city of God, that this world is not a veil of tears, Contra medieval Christian thought, this world is not a veil of tears. We do not simply see as through a glass darkly. We are not in a temporary vessel until we go to life everlasting. We are not mired in original sin and corrupt and incapable of improving ourselves. But rather, the claim of the radical enlightenment is that following, really achieving the highest expression of the Renaissance, but the claim of the radical enlightenment, a claim that had begun in the Renaissance but really comes into its own in the radical enlightenment, is that the created world, the world of men and women, is not mired in original sin. It is not inevitably corrupt. It can improve itself. And the fundamental ontological ground of our existence is not Plato's world of forms, is not the heavenly city, is not Augustine's city of God, is not the eternal hereafter, although that may very well exist. The Enlightenment is of two minds about that. But is this world the here and now and the way we organize our living together in the world, which is society? The collective set of institutions and practices that organize our reciprocal relations amongst one another. And it's through that world that we transform ourselves in our innermost sense, and we transform the world around us, nature, the environment, etc. And it's really, right, in British North America and with the American Revolution that essentially this realization of the Enlightenment, that society is the fundamental grounds of human existence, and humans can transform themselves through transforming their society that for the first time in human history, this is put at the heart of a political order. I want to stress that again. It's this fundamental realization of the Enlightenment, right? The Enlightenment fundamentally realized two things. I left off the second one, so I'm going to say it now. The, the radical Enlightenment, the post rousseau Enlightenment, fundamentally realized two things. That society is the fundamental grounds of human existence, and it's where we create ourselves and transform ourselves. We create a human world beyond a natural animal world, and we recreate and recreate that human world again and again. And secondly, the fundamental realization of the radical enlightenment that it's in that, that it's civil society, right, in the free relations of our daily life between the family and the state. It's civil society that essentially is the realm where humans can be most free and self-determining, where they can most come to be something different than they are, and that they can therefore perhaps change the laws also that govern and regulate the world of the family and civil society to allow for even greater freedom. So the conclusion of the radical enlightenment is in society that we create and recreate ourselves, and above all, once we've organized society, once we achieve an organized society of Hegel's 
uh, uh, family, civil society, and the state. It's in civil society, the free relations of daily life, in our free association, assembly, cooperation, trade, exchange, discussion, and debate with each other, that humanity ultimately right, pursues its purpose. But there is no one single purpose. The purposes are various and infinite. There's no one way of being human in the world, right? And it's those two realizations of the radical enlightenment that are politically defended and asserted and at the heart of the American Revolution, all right? And that's why the American Revolution must be defended against the contemporary progressive left attack on it. That's why the American Revolution must be defended because society must be defended. And I want to leave you with two quotes from uh, radical politicos and enlightenment philosophs. One uh, uh, kind of schooled and educated, another one self-taught. Uh, the first is the self-taught autodidact radical politico and enlightenment philosoph Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine wrote the most famous tract of the American Revolution called Common Sense. And in Common Sense, which was published in January of 1776, Thomas Paine had to achieve one task. He had to take an American public that had come to conclude that it was ready to take up arms and resist British imperial forms. Because after all, Common Sense comes out in January 1776 and the American Revolution actually broke out months earlier in the spring of 1775 with the battles of Lexington and Concord. The American public, or a part of it, had already taken up arms against British imperial authority. But they weren't re yet, yet ready for independence. They were just kind of reformists with guns, if you will. They hoped that they could simply beat the British Empire back to good reforms. And Thomas Paine needed to convince them that it was over, that the British radical and reform movement in Britain was not going to take up arms, was not going to resist the parliamentary order at home, that the parliamentary order would remain unreformed and unrepresentative, Therefore, because the parliamentary order would remain unreformed and unrepresentative and monopolized by the land elite, there would be no change in Britain. And since there would be no change in Britain, there was no hope for British America if it stayed in the British Empire. So they needed to hit the exit button. And Common Sense was published in January 1776, and it was the most read pamphlet in the entire history of colonial America. It was not simply widely printed and distributed, it was read in pubs and coffee houses and at post offices throughout the land. How did Thomas Paine's common sense begin? He writes, this is his first proper lines after his preface, everyone. Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. The one encourages intercourse, the other creates distinctions. The first is a patron, the last a punisher. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one. Society is in every state a blessing, right? That the political must always serve the freedom of the social. And the freedom of the social is the freedom of the collective and the freedom of the individual. You cannot understand the freedom of bourgeois society and the freedom of civil society within bourgeois society unless you understand that it is simultaneously dialectically interrelated as the freedom of the collective and the freedom of the individual. And so Paine says we must get rid of the British imperial government and create a new independent American government if we are to preserve society. He is saying society must be defended. And of course, in defending colonial social institutions and practices, the colonial Americanists come to articulate themselves that what they are doing is not defending their traditional English rights and liberties, but rather defending practices and rights that should be, could be available to all human beings as such. As Locke and Rousseau 
and Thomas Paine will put it, human qua human, the human as such, right? The colonial resistance movement could have said, we just want our traditional English liberties. We simply want to return to the traditional English rights before the Seven Years' War. They didn't. They said what we're defending are the civil rights, the, the natural rights in organized society, in civil society, the civil rights, the social freedom, the collective and individual freedom, the rights and abilities and capacities of society that all people should have and could have. And they opened up a gigantic chasm, right, over which many, many people made claims and stepped in. Many, many people beyond those who had traditional English rights be, be, before the Seven Years' War, they op opened up an open-ended process in defending society. At the conclusion of the American Revolution, <clears throat> or towards the conclusion of the American Revolution, in 1783, uh, the Academy of Lyon, many of you have probably heard of these essay contests that the 18th century famously had. The Enlightenment loved to have these essay contests out to the Republic of Letters. Uh, most famously, Rousseau answers the essay contests of the Academy of Dijon in, in, in 1750 and then later in 1754-55 when he produces the first discourse and the second discourse, the discourse on the arts and sciences and the discourse on inequality. Well, these academies are having these contests all the time. And in 1783, the Academy of Lyon has a contest has the discovery of America been useful or hurtful to mankind? Why did they have this contest? They had this contest because the American Revolution is coming to an end. In 1781, Lord Cornwallis and the British forces are defeated by a combined French and American force at Yorktown, Virginia. The Franco-American force of General Washington and Lafayette have pincered uh, 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 Lord Cornwallis's force against the sea and sitting out there at the sea is the French Navy. It's over, it's done. Lord Cornwallis gives up the ghost. He surrenders, letters go back to Britain and the conservative Tory prime minister, Lord North or neo-Tory prime minister, Lord North gives up the ghost, abdicates his position and King George III has to give up the ghost. And they pick a ministry initially under a guy named the Marquess of Rockingham, later under the Earl of Shelburne that negotiates peace with the Americans. So as of 1783, a new country has come into geopolitical relations. A new country has entered the powers of the earth. And that's why the Academy of Leon is having this, this thing. Was America worth it, discovering America? Is this rebellion and all this bloodshed worth it? And a very famous radical Enlightenment philosopher, Abbe Renal, a, 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 a friend of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, well, sorry, no, a reader and follower of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and a friend of collaborator of Denise Diderot, writes the most famous response to this. And I just want to read you his response. Again, this is the Abbe Renault. He is a, a, a follower of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He is one of the most important figures in the Radical Enlightenment. He uh, 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 is a collaborator of Denis Diderot. And he writes, this success was the first step of English America towards the revolution. He's writing this defense of the founding of America because there was an American Revolution, he says. The founding of America is worthwhile because there was an American Revolution that's created the United States of America. It was begun to be openly desired. The principles which justified it, meaning the American Revolution, were, disper were, were dispersed on all sides. These principles, which were indebted for their birth to Europe, and particularly to England, he means the Enlightenment, right, had been transplanted in America by philosophy. Again, the Enlightenment. The knowledge and the discoveries of the mother country were turning against herself, and she was told that, again, the knowledge and discoveries of the mother country, of Great Britain and of Europe, were being turned against them, turned against the old regime of the absolute monarchies in Europe and the parliamentary monarchy in Great Britain, right? Their own knowledge and achievements are being turned against them by the American Revolution. The knowledge and the discoveries of the mother country were turning against herself, and she was told that care must be taken not to confound together society and government. That they may be known distinctly, their origin should be considered. So society and government are radically distinct, the Abbe Renal is saying. Man thrown, as it were, by chance upon this globe, 
surrounded by all the evils of nature, obliged continually to defend and protect his life against the storms and tempests of the air, against the inundations of water, against the fire of volcanoes, against the intemperate of frigid or torrid zones, the intemperature of frigid or torrid zones, against the sterility of the earth, which refuses him ailment, or its baneful fecundity, which makes him poison spring up, which makes poison spring up beneath his feet. In short, against the claws and teeth of savage beasts, who dispute with him his habitation and his prey, and attacking his person seem resolved to render themselves rulers of this globe, of which he thinks himself to be the master. Man in this state, alone and abandoned to himself, could do nothing for his preservation. It was necessary, therefore, that he should unite himself and associate with his like in order to bring together their strength and intelligence in common stock, i.e. society. It is by this union that he has triumphed over so many evils that he has fashioned this globe to his use, restrained the rivers, subjugated the seas, created his subsistence, conquered a part of the animals in obliging them to serve him, and driven others far from his empire to the depths of deserts or of woods where their number diminishes from age to age. What a man alone would not have been able to effect, men have executed in concert. And all together they preserve their work. In a free society, in cooperating together, we can transform the world much more than we can independently. And in transforming the world, we create a second nature and that second nature becomes the foundation of future human beings. And they can recreate that world as a third nature, a fourth nature. And we remove ourselves ever forth from nature and become ever more based on something wholly human that solely we create. We become more artificial human made in, I don't mean that in a dismissive sense, but in a revolutionary sense. We are more artificial than any other animal. So he writes, all together they preserve their work. Such is the origin, such the advantage, and the end of all society. Government owes its birth to the necessity of preventing and repressing the injuries which the associated individuals had to fear from one another. It is the sentinel who watches in order that the common labors may not be disturbed. In order that the common social labors to transform the world, our free cooperation, our free association, our free relations that create our common social labors that transform the world. In order for the social not to be disturbed, we create the political, not to rule over us absolutely, but to simply settle our disputes. Thus society originates in the wants of men, government in their vices. Society tends always to good, government always to tend to the repressing of evil. Society is the first. It is in its origin independent and free. Government was instituted for it and is but its instrument. It is for one society to command. It is for the other government to obey. Society created the public power. Government, which has received it from society, ought to consecrate it entirely to its use. In short, society is essentially good. Government, as is well known, may be and is but too often evil, okay? So in other words, Abbe Renal will go on to argue, this is why the American Revolution was a great achievement. The realization somewhere practically, right, that society was more important, the social was more important than the political, meaning the revolution by arms, the revolutionary achievement that the social would not be subjugated to the political, but rather that the social would self-organize. It didn't descend into anarchy, the American colonies. They had well-organized committees of correspondence, committees of safety, committees of inspection. They routinely corresponded with one another. They built militias. They said, we are not dissolving into a state of war. We are rather returning to society to defend it against the true criminal, the true anarchist, which is the king and the parliament in Great Britain, right? The American revolutionary said, like Locke, that it's the absolute sovereign power, the crown and parliament of Great Britain that is the anarchist, the criminal against society. Not like Hobbes, who said you needed the absolute sovereign power to have society. 
The American revolutionary said, no, society must be defended from the criminal, the absolute sovereign power of the crown and the parliament. So they took up arms to defend the social, to overturn the political and put a new political in place. And in doing so, they clearly enunciated that the basis of the social was humans qua humans, that the living together of men and women in the world, that their ability to benefit from one another through their free intercourse and cooperation and Congress and interaction through their living together in the world was not limited by ethnicity, religion, language, race, nationality, place of origin, any of those things. It was there that society was most clearly articulated as the master of the state. It was there that civil society was made most distinct and separate from the state. And civil society was begun to be given its purchase on the world, not simply as a category of abstraction, but of real everyday life. It is in the United States of America that Burge, the bourgeois revolution had the greatest practical purchase in the world by making the most complete bourgeois society, by making the most complete separation between the state and civil society, by creating a society and civil society that simply depended on men and women freely living together in the world, irrespective of any accident of birth or circumstance. And it is for that reason that America is best understood not as a country that had a revolution, but a revolution that has a country. And it is for that reason that the American Revolution must be defended because society must be defended. And simply to conclude, and I know I've long trespassed on your time, but this really is my conclusion, right? The progressive attack on the American Revolution, which is part and parcel of their attack on society, you should not be mistaken about it, right? has extended much farther than it was in the early 20th century. Because the neo-progressives, by which I mean the post-New Left, the post-1960s progressives, do not simply tell us that there were two phases of the American Revolution. One phase, the earlier phase, the 1776 phase, good. A later phase, the constitutional phase, the counter-revolution from above, bad. Now, the post-New Left, neo-progressive phase tell us that the American Revolution was counter-revolutionary from the whole way down, that it was bad the whole way down. You can read Gerald Horne's The Counter-Revolution of 1776, which serves as the main empirical basis for the New York Times 1619 Project essay on the American Revolution, in, where, in which it's claimed that the American Revolution was counter-revolutionary from the beginning that there was a movement against slavery going on against Great Britain. It was gonna expand throughout the entire British Empire and it was gonna overturn slavery in the Americas and that's why the radical colonial American resistance movement took shape to prevent the abolition of slavery. I'm happy to explain to you in the Q&A why that is just empirically absurd, okay? But essentially the post-New Left neo-progressive now say it was counter-revolutionary from the beginning and in the most recent work of post-New Left neo-progressive historiography, that by Woody Holton called Liberty is Sweet, it's actually contemplated whether, the, it's actually suggested the American Revolution was probably not a greater good overall, meaning he's happy in the conclusion of that to put together the pluses and minuses and suggest it may have been a bad thing overall, right? That it may have not been worthwhile overall. And indeed, there's a book that uh, uh, by a guy named Matthew Lockwood, uh, that is another work of post-New Left neo-progressive historiography that steals the name to begin the world anew from Thomas Paine. My God, he steals from Thomas Paine to begin the world anew to talk about a book that totally rejects the American Revolution because he shows how basically by you know six degrees of separation, all these people are negatively affected by unintended consequences of the revolution. The post-New Left neo-progressives have basically moved to assert the American Revolution was basically bad from the top down, right? That's because they are not really interested in defending society. Rather, they're interested in managing and maintaining it. In the, in the combination that they've had since the early 20th century, which is technocracy, bureaucracy from above, 
and hallowed out plebiscites democracy from below, right? As we live in a society, a civil society that is continuously in crisis since the Industrial Revolution, as the mediating societies of civil society are increasingly thrown into chaos and undermined, we continue to be ruled by progressive technocracy and plebiscites, but now in the post new left neo-progressive view, we can do away with the American Revolution altogether and we can introduce a racialist classification of this neo-progressive uh, technocratic slash democratic rule. And that's at the heart of the 1619 Project. The 1619 Project is about introducing racialist techniques of bureaucratic and technocratic management into the Bonapartist state, the capitalist state's management of the crisis of civil society since the European Revolution of 1848, since the Industrial Revolution. What is the only alternative to this? The only alternative to this is the defense of society. What is the defense of society? That is socialism. Socialism is the only political movement that seeks to defend social freedom, which is simultaneously collective and individual freedom in bourgeois society, in civil society. It is socialism that seeks to defend that by organizing a mass movement in social society, sorry, in civil society that serves as the basis for a socialist party that is independent of the mainstream capitalist parties, the Democrats and Republicans, and their various falsifications of history, whether that's a rah-rah um, uh, 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 Republican, libertarian, or Christian nationalist history, or whether that's a uh, progressivist, bureaucratic, or racialist, neo-progressive 1619 democratic interpretation of history. It is rather, right, an, uh, 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 organizing in civil society the working class independently in an independent socialist party freely of the mainstream capitalist parties, right? Socialism seeks to defend society. It seeks to organize freely in civil society, the working class independent of the capitalist political parties, the Democrats and Republicans, into an independent socialist party designed to save bourgeois society by transforming it. Because as Marx and Engels pointed out in the Communist Manifesto in 1848, uh, roughly, um, uh, over a, a <clears throat> wow, how long ago was it now? 175 years ago, right? As Marx and Engels pointed out, it has become evident that the bourgeoisie is unfit any longer to be the ruling class in society and to impose its conditions of existence upon society as an overriding law. It is unfit to rule because it is incompetent to assure an existence to its slave within his slavery, meaning the wage la labor within wage labor because it cannot help letting him sink into such a state that it has to feed him instead of being fed by him. Society can no longer live under this bourgeoisie. In other words, its, its existence is no longer compatible with society. Again, because it bears repeating. Society can no longer live under this bourgeoisie. In other words, its existence is no longer compatible with society. So society, according to classical Marxism, can only be, trans it can only be preserved by transforming it. Okay, I'm really, really sorry for going way over the time I intended. I will stick around to answer any questions or concerns that you have. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, I'm Xing Yao. Nice uh, to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you, and thank you for the inaugural lecture. And uh, I have got two questions, and I'm afraid that there might be a little broad. The first one is about the definition of the word revolution, because in, uh, by, the, by the beginning of the lecture, you quoted Karl Marx, uh, Lenin, and Adorno about the American Revolution. But uh, from the different angles of time, we have different concepts of revolution, like you may be imagining a, uh, a English one, an American one, and a French one, and the Russian one, and so on and so on. And people have different opinions about it, with, with the draw the lines of those revolutions. So I was wondering if you could uh, Give us a little hint about that. Like, how do we call a historical event a revolution? And um, what ideas should we think about like, when we are drawing the beginnings and the end lines of that? Okay, that's a good question. So, um, 
how to talk about revolution in general and then revolutionary specifically, like American, French. Okay, so um, what I'd say is this, that there's really only one bourgeois revolution. Uh, what I mean by that is that there's, the bourgeois revolution is the revolution of society and the revolution for society. Let me explain what I mean by that. Basically, with all the transformations that were taking place in the early modern period, the 16th, the 17th, and the 18th century, from the, the, the 1500s to the 1700s, with all those transformations that were taking place, you were getting the development of bourgeois social relations, the social relations of the free exchange of labor and its products, right? That is, the social relations constituted by free labor, right? The exchange of free labor and its products, right? Those social relations were arising in, in everyday life, in the quotidian existence of everyday life, in the corners of life. If you went out into the countryside in the 16th, 17th century, it looked like a medieval countryside. But now, the aristocratic lord was not any more a feudal lord with dominion over the people. He was a landlord. In places like the Netherlands and in England, he rented out the land. In places like France, he didn't have any control of the land. He simply collected taxes from the peasants that worked it. And those laborers and farmers on the land were now free. In the Netherlands and England, they were in a kind of a commercial tenant farmers and agrarian wage laborers. In places like France and Spain, they were independent peasant proprietors, but they were free. Meaning, is Xinhua was the name? Xinhua. Xinhua. Meaning Xinhua, in the quotidian everyday existence, there emerged essentially people being able to set the course of their own existence. It was minimal at first. The peasant living in rural France had a plot of land and just traditional medieval tools and traditional medieval animal husbandry and traditional medieval crop rotation. But now, they, if they made a surplus, that surplus didn't immediately go to the feudal lord, right? That surplus could be used by themselves after they paid what was owed to them in taxes to the absolute monarchy, right? Who paid the feudal lord who now held an office in the monarchy, right? It was a tax office state. That French peasant in the 17th century, now if they produce a surplus, could keep it from themselves and could trade it, go to the market, the village and trade it, not just for commodities produced in the region, but throughout Europe and even by later 17th century beyond. Tobacco from Virginia, rice from Maryland, or indigo from the Carolinas, um, cotton and silk fine piece goods from Bengal and India, coffee, spice, uh, 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 cinnamon, nutmeg from the Spice Islands, Southeast Asia, porcelains, glassware from China, from East Asia, right? That, that peasant could save and buy. They were setting the course of their own existence. And these people began to enter into free relations with one another, meaning they no longer met one another in the world. They no longer met one another in the world as being determined by their caste relations or their guild relations. They met each other simply as free individuals willing their relations with one another, exchanging goods and services with one another, right? And it was in that world of freely exchanging, freely willing, that essentially you had the beginnings of liberalism or social contract theory in an ideal form. That, that, that's why Marx wonderfully in, I believe the German ideology, but it might be in the Holy Family, Marx wonderfully calls liberalism, I love this expression, and he means it seriously, not dismissively. He says liberalism is the practical idealism of daily life in bourgeois society. Again, liberalism is the practical idealism of daily life in bourgeois society arising right, in quotidian daily existence is free cooperation and exchange and it's bringing to bring a large market and a large division of labor and that is allowing human beings to specialize, right, to focus on producing the goods and services they're good at and that is allowing for a greater market, a greater division of labor and this is all being freely determined by people deciding how to pursue the course of their own existence. And more people come into the market, come into the division of labor and decide how to determine the course of their own existence, the more other people can determine the course of their own existence. Because the greater there's a market, there's a greater division of labor, more people can leave their unfree, isolated backwater condition and enter into a world of bourgeois social relations where they can set the course of their own existence. So you slowly get in late medieval and early modern Western Europe in quotidian life, right, bourgeois social relations.
right, a free society developing that becomes the basis, right, for individuals to set the course of their own existence. And then more individuals make the choice to set their course of their own existence and they expand society, they expand the market, they expand the general will, they expand collective freedom. And that allows even more people to come in. And you get this building process where over time across these centuries, you have what I call the revolution of society, where by 1720, let's say, if I'm a ca <clears throat> cattle farmer in Scotland and there's a depression in my area and I'm a, a young person and I'm thrown off, I can try and go nearby and find some work in commercial agriculture. But if I can't, I can try and go in Glasgow and find some work or Edinburgh, find some work in manufacturing. If I can't, I might go all the way down to Liverpool and get a ship across to America, right? A whole world is coming to being right, of interdependence between people, but it's a free interdependence that allows for an even greater level of individual self-determination. That is the revolution of society. What I would characterize as the actual revolutions are the moments that political orders throughout the West do not further the development of this revolution of society, but rather they become an obstacle to the development of the revolution of society, and that triggers the revolution for society. What I mean by that concretely is this. As you have the end of the Middle Ages and the rise of bourgeois society in Western Europe, you get uh, these Renaissance monarchies, these centralized territorial monarchies that tend to further the revolution of society. They use the collective power of the absolute monarch, whether we're talking about the Valois or Bourbon monarchies in France, or the Tudor or the Stuart monarchies in England, or we're talking about the the, the, the Habsburg monarchies in Spain and Austria, right? These monarchies use their collective course of powers to put down bastard feudalism, to create unified economies, homog homogenized measures, to, to, to unify their realms, to pacify their realms so people can peaceably exchange and associate. Those absolute monarchies, those political orders, those parliamentary constitutional republics are serving the, the revolution of society. They're helping to develop it. But at some point, uh, often they become blocks, hindrances. They decide, no, your society, civil society, should serve us, the political order. Most famously, Charles, James I and Charles I, the Stuart monarchs of England attempt to do that. They're absolute monarchs that say to the English population, effectively, we're absolute sovereigns, right? Parliament and people basically are, are completely subject to us. And in that moment, you have essentially uh, the revolution of society, of bourgeois social relations and daily life becomes the revolution for society. You get the parliamentary side formed and it overthrows the absolute monarchy of Charles I and creates this incredibly radical experimental republic. That had happened 80 years earlier in the, uh, in the Spanish Netherlands. The northern seven provinces had successfully broken away from the Spanish Habsburg monarchy when the Spanish Habsburg monarchy had ceased to serve the needs of the revolution of society, and that led to the Dutch Revolt, which was a revolution for society. And the English Republic and later the Glorious Revolution, which also overthrows James II, an absolute monarch who's trying to stand in the way of the revolution of society, has become an obstacle to the revolution of society, leads to the Glorious Revolution, the revolution for society. And so what I would say is, you should think of the revolution of society as something that plays out because of global developments, but has as its heartland, the area where bourgeois social relations takes greatest effect in the West, Western Europe and its Atlantic offshoots in North America. And it's really um, there that the revolution of society, it, which is global, is having full effects. And it's there when political forms that had furthered the revolution of society come to be obstacles that you get revolutions for society Movements of all social groups, not simply you know middle class people or middling sort people or working or plebeian people, but people from all over, top to bottom of social scale, right? Openly say they're trying to further the patria, the fatherland, right? The, as their own, and even some say society against the kind of arbitrary power that's interfering with society. They use this term, arbitrary power, that's interfering with the free development of society. And they want to overthrow that arbitrary power and create a public power, as Abbe Renault puts it, that serves the free development of society, if that makes sense. 
And, and those are the moments of specific revolutions, like the English Revolution in the mid-17th century, where Parliament overthrows the absolute monarchy and creates a parliamentary republic. Like the Glorious Revolution of 1688, where the English Parliament and population with a Dutch-led uh, uh, European invasion force overthrows the absolute monarchy of James II and creates a constitutional monarchy and parliamentary government. Like the American Revolution, where the American revolutionaries overthrow uh, the British imperial authority and basically liberalize and democratize their pre-existing colonial institutions to create the most liberal and democratic polity that had yet existed in human history. And like the French Revolution, which is a very late bourgeois revolution, which overthrows the kind of enlightened absolute monarchy of King Louis XVI, who had actually, he and his predecessor, Louis XV, uh, had been furthering the development of civil society, had been furthering the development of bourgeois society, Burgerliga Gesellschaft. But what happened was, again and again, the aristocracy, the traditional aristocracy and the church complained about the way civil society was being advanced and the monarchy had to put the brakes on it. So they generated all this discontent. The enlightened Bourbon monarchy, the absolute Bourbon monarchy of 18th century France was furthering civil society, but then pausing it in the interest of the traditional ruling, ruling caste of the first estate of the clergy and the second estate of the nobility and the monarchy itself. And this created discontents that also ultimately issued in the French Revolution. Those, that, those were the, the, bourgeois, the classical bourgeois revolutions. That was the period as a whole of the bourgeois revolution, which is both the revolution of society and specific political instances of the revolution for society, where basically elements, groups in society organize to overthrow an arbitrary power that's seen as a hindrance to the free development of, in their terms, the patria, the fatherland, the nation, ultimately society, and to allow for its further free development, if, if that makes sense. And those are the instances of uh, bourgeois revolution in that specific sense. After the industrial revolution, after that, you of course have what Marx calls the creation of the contradiction of bourgeois society. That is, bourgeois society goes into contradiction with itself. Marx elaborates that most clearly. I just read from the Communist Manifesto, right? I read from the famous chapter one, Bourgeois and Proletarians of the Communist Manifesto in 1848, where Marx and Engels explain that bourgeois society has developed since the Middle Ages and has been creating this world of what they call society with the capital S. In the manifesto, they call it society. And they basically say that with the Industrial Revolution, this society has entered into crisis of contradiction. It's created two classes at loggerheads, the capitalist, the bourgeoisie, and, 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 and the proletariat, the working class, right? And it says these are the two classes. It doesn't say these classes create the contradiction. They make clear that it's the contradiction, it's industrialization, that leads to the creation of these two classes that are at loggerheads. And essentially, while this contradiction goes on, caused by the proletarianization of society, right, which takes place with and through the Industrial Revolution, industrialization and urbanization in Europe in the 19th century, that you get the ruinization of society, okay? Think about that, that beautiful language Marx and Engels use in the manifesto, right? The bourgeoisie no longer deserved a rule, because the bourgeois society over which they rule no longer feeds them, but rather has to be fed by them, right? It's a, a beautiful language, right, that is gonna anticipate the later Marxist critique of the kind of progressive welfare state, right? You know that the bourgeoisie no longer has the right to rule because the bourgeoisie no longer rules through civil society. How do you know the bourgeoisie no longer rules through civil society? Because the state is not simply a neutral instrument which serves the self-expansion of civil society, but rather the state has come to rise over civil society, the Bonapartist or capitalist state, and it's now managing society principally through feeding society, through social legislation, through the welfare state, through the crumbs that it redistributes to the working class, if that makes sense. And so after the Industrial Revolution, after the revolutions of 1848, we essentially have bourgeois society enter into contradiction with itself. The relations of production, that is the bourgeois social relations of free labor and the exchange of its products, enters into crisis with the forces of production, right? The whole array of the transformation of nature that was created by the very bourgeois society, the very free society that's been developing in the Western world since and throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. 
And that society has come into contradiction with itself. So any further bourgeois revolutions, whether it's the revolution of 1848 or it's uh, um, uh, the, 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 the Russian revolution of 1905 or any other such revolution is necessarily going to initially be a bourgeois or bourgeois democratic revolution that is in a broad sense in contradiction with itself because bourgeois society itself is. Addison. Yeah. Um, so I want to sort of raise uh, the title of the teaching, The mm -hmm. American Revolution in the Left, mm -hmm. and specifically about um, the contemporary left. Um, and I wanted to just raise three examples um, motivated mainly by like Platypus's engagements over the past year or so. Um, and I apologize if, you know, if you're not very familiar with some of these groups or um, if I mischaracterized their views in any way. Um, and I don't have like a very pointed question, but I, I just want to raise um, this. So I'm thinking of, for example, like Caleb Boppin's Center for Political Innovation. Could you say the first the name again? Caleb Boppin. Oh, Caleb uh, Boppin. Yeah, okay. The Center for Political Innovation and more okay. broadly like Mavic Communism, which is sort of reacting to a like anti-Americanism they see amongst the wider left, um, which they view as a problem for it's first of all alienating to the American working class and a hindrance to organizing the working class. Um, so they fall into sort of a more vul like a more vulgar, patriotic American nationalism. Um, and then the Socialist Workers Party, who we've been engaging a lot lately, who views the, the American Constitution very much as a document of and for the ruling class, but one which protects the bourgeois rights of the working class against the working class. So, you know, they'll talk a lot about, um, they, may, they, they often defend the constitutional rights. Um, you know, they speak a lot about protection from like double jeopardy by being tried at the state level and then the federal level. They've talked a lot about, um, they condemn, you know, the FBI raids on Mar-a-Lago and the FBI raids in the Uhuru, like African freedom movement. Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll defend the Supreme Court as like a protection against authoritarian rule by the executive branch. Um, and then I wanted to raise finally like the Marxist unity group. Could, Addison, I was looking, yeah. the second one, so the Caleb Moppet, the, sorry, you, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you sure. just to reiterate these sure, each sure. when you're done with all three, but uh, the second one is the judicial power. And that's not a concern of the Caleb Maupin group. I'm so, I, I was talking also the after the CPI, I raised the Socialist Workers Party. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay. And, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, their uh, preoccupation. You absolutely did. Defending I, constitutional right. Okay. Um, sorry. And the Constitution as a document which protects the working class from the ruling class. However flawed, um, you know, the original, you, I think we'll call it the like bourgeois document maybe. Um, and then I wanted to raise just like the Marxist unity group, mm -hmm. um, which works within the BSA and has largely been influenced by like the Communist Party of Great Britain. And uh, I think in their party program, their platform, they, you know, they have this emphasis on like what they see as like a democratic constitutionalism or like a radical republicanism. And they, they take this from what they see as a radical republican current in Marx and Engels and Kautsky and Lenin. Um, and they'll talk a lot about, you know, like abolition of the electoral college, abolition of the Supreme Court. Um, and they sort of see the immediate tasks of Marxists today as sort of leading bourgeois discontent, um, being like the leading figure in continuing a bourgeois democratic revolution, um, in bringing about a new constitution in the United States. Um, and so I just wanted to, and this is maybe too broad, but I just wanted to raise these you know, different ways that the contemporary left takes up the legacy of the American Revolution and what you think, you know, if these preoccupations point to, you know, problems in the history of Marxism or in the history of the left or, you know, if these various tensions between these groups and their preoccupations point to or illuminate something about the nature of the incomplete American Revolution today, the problems raised by the incomplete American Revolution and, um, yeah, just, you know, yeah, I don't, that's maybe. No, those, uh, those are great questions. Um, I'm, I'm just going to be straightforward. There's no way I'll give you satisfactory answers okay. to all those right yeah, now. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to raise. What I think I will try and do, though, is I think I can kind of group elements of them together. 
Um, first off, I have heard the name Caleb Maupin, and obviously I'm a platypus member. I'm aware of engagements we've had, but I don't know a lot about the Center for Political Innovation. But you, just so I understand, you had said that their position is that the kind of contemporary left's um, abuse of the American Revolution is alienating for the American working class. The, the general like anti-Americanism amongst the, the left, right? And they sort of, and I'm talking about like more broadly like you said MAGA communism. Yeah, right. It, what's been dubbed like MAGA communism. MAGA communism. Which okay. is sort of just like pandering to what they see as like the deplorable Trump electoral electoral um, and sort of just like adopting like the more vulgar, like patriotic American nationalism. They they want to do that. They, yes, they do that. They... Well, uh, so so you I, so the risk then is run by such an approach because obviously I'm claiming that the American Revolution was foundational for classical Marxism, and I'm you know I said nothing here tonight that is in any way you know um, original thought. It's all in classical Marxism, and uh, uh, you know I'm reminded of the wonderful line by Adorno. You you know whenever you confront present controversies, you notice that. Everything you want to say has been said before, but much better the first time around. So in my kind of vulgar understanding, I've tried to put forward the spirit of classical Marxism. But I, I, what I would say is, of course, there can be a risk that somebody can misconstrue this as some kind of like um, American nationalism, right? That what was said here tonight can somehow be American nationalist because it's defense of the American Revolution. But again, I want to go back to the premise of what I was arguing which is not the premise, sorry, but, but my, my fundamental assertion, which is America, the United States of America, is not a country with, that had a revolution, but is a revolution that took hold of a country. But it's a world revolution, right? And, and what I would insist to you is that what makes the American Revolution, ang or sorry, what makes, I mean, I think these guys, I'm not that familiar with them, but there's an insight, like working class people do not like, of any stripe or background, do not like, right, the abuse of the American Revolution or the idea of the founding ideals. But guess what? It's not just American working class people, native or indigenous, black, white, Hispanic, or Asian. Working class people the whole world over do not like the abuse of the American Revolution. They have very little time for it, right? They're fully aware of the fact, right? So many of them contain behind their idea that if I can't make it in this country, there's another country across the world, it's an idealized vision, but you know, there's some practical element of it. There's some society that does not care about my background that I can go to, and even though I have nothing, I become a flourishing member of that society. That is something that not simply people living in the United States has held, but people across the world have held, right? Whether it's you know, a bus driver in Nairobi tonight, or you know, in, in London, or where have you, right? That if I don't make it here, there's a chance of remaking or starting it in America. And that's something you see from the 18th century. From the 18th century, you see people talking about the possibility, right, of going to America and basically starting over again. So what I would say is in defending the American Revolution, one does, of course, appeal to a certain patriotic sensibility of the working class, but it's not a patriotic sensibility of the American working class, either indigenous or native, but of all working class people that, that, that at the very minimum want a land where there is a society that irrespective of the accidents of birth or circumstance, however they were told who they were at birth, what they had to be, how they should feel, what sexual desire they have, that they could go somewhere where that could all be, they could set the course of their own existence that's something that many people like to hold on to, right? Now, I would assist, of course, I, I take the position, of course, that, that a socialist party, and I'm not trying to be prescriptive, there is no socialist party, I don't have a socialist politics, but I would take the position that there can be no distinction between immigrant workers and, and native workers in any kind of socialist party. It's gotta be the fundamental civil rights of all working people here, right? And ultimately aligned with all people in the world, right? And, and it should be, uh, you know, that, that, that has to be clear. But um, I don't think uh, appealing to a certain patriotic sensibility of the American Revolution is um, to be nationalistic. 
It can be nationalistic, but I don't think it is because most of the people that I see that are offended by the American Revolution being denigrated, most of the people that I know that even though they, I know many people, people in my family who loathe Trump, right? But who really, really, you know, like him going to Mount Rushmore and giving that July 4th speech because, hey, what's all this stuff about tearing down statues, the American Revolution, all great stuff. Those people don't think that they're defending themselves. They think they're defending the idea of a society where people can simply freely associate and cooperate and that there are no ethnic or religious or racial limits to that, right? I mean, what, what needs to be remembered is that summer of 2020, taking down those statues, all of that, right? You know, that, 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 that um, was viewed by many people as an assault, right? Many people doing that, right, claim not simply that that wasn't true in 1776. Of course, it wasn't. Right? It was an ideal articulated right, that opened up the possibility of practical transformation in the world. And by the way, it began immediately creating practical transformation. It's no accident that it's in the 1770s that the first manumission abolitionist societies, the first societies to eliminate slavery are founded in the, in the revolutionary British North America of the United States. It's no accident in the 1770s, people found societies for collaboration with indigenous peoples because they see this as an opportunity to try and incorporate indigenous peoples into the commercial manufacturing bourgeois society developing in coastal North America instead of riding roughshod over them and expropriating their land. It's no accident that women begin to make claims for civil rights, for property ownership, for full participation in the 1780s. Surely, Right, I'm saying these are at the margins. I'm not saying these achieve immediate victory or anything like that. But, but that's what I think most people are defending when they want to defend the American Revolution. Not, right, some let's keep the country as it was in the 1780s or the 1920s, but this idea of a, a, a place in the world that people simply freely interact, have Congress intercourse, cooperate, exchange with one another, transform the world around them and can be free self-determining individuals and can benefit from the free cooperation with other individuals. And that, that, that you, Addison, can believe that Desmond, you know, I'm making this up, I don't know your views, but you, your religious views, you could believe Desmond's going to hell. Desmond could believe that I'm an idiot, right? You could say, oh, James is probably religiously observant and I'm an, Desmond's an atheist, I'm an idiot. I believe in the worst things, right? Uh, we all could believe, we could all believe each other's religions or atheistic beliefs are stupid. Each other's uh, sexual practices are awful. Each other's sexual practices are great. Each other's interests are stupid. Hobbies are dumb. But we nevertheless can all benefit from the cooperation in a free society that we couldn't possibly achieve on our own. In a society of full, free, and civil equal rights for all. Right? That's what I take to be the appeal to most people in the United States. And I would say you can defend that in a thoroughly international sense because I know so, I am just, for, as a professional story, having to have gone around different places in the world. I'm not the most well-traveled person, but I, I've you know, been to every continent except for Africa. And working class people like the idea of, hey, if I got to, you know, got to America, is this possible, that person, you know what I mean? That kind of thing, you know, et cetera. So, and, and, and often the most, you know, it's my mother's side of the family, which immigrated from Hungary, are much more vociferous defenders of this kind of patriotic vision of America than my father's side of the family, right? Because they're recent immigrants. They're relatively recent immigrants, and they absolutely came here for these reasons and won't hurt it said otherwise, right? I mean, of course, you know, um, uh, they're aware of social and political realities, right? That, 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 but nevertheless, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And I don't mean to lump in like Caleb Moffin with the worst of what you see on like Twitter of like MAGA communism or like patriotic socialism, but just as a general trend amongst that. I'm totally unfamiliar with MAGA communism, but I, 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 see, I, I see it as, um, I mean, I've run into people who identify as left and MAGA, right? Like, um, I can't remember, she writes for Newsweek. Um, uh, these types of people. Um, I've not heard the term MAGA communism before, but what I would say is if you leave the American Revolution to the progressive left's contemporary narration of it, contemporary take on it, it will fall into those people's hands, mm -hmm. right? Like it will exactly go to that route. Just to, I, I, I don't, to try and, again, your other questions, people talk about the Constitution, creating a new Constitution. So I, I want to say this. I, I think the Constitution broadly needs um, to be defended. Let me explain why that is the case. Um, 
the Constitution is not a once and for all uh, iron cage, right? It's meant to basically be a reformable, transformable uh, political order, okay? Why was the Constitution the culmination of the American Revolution? Why was it not contra the progressives? Or let's say the new progressives hate the entire American Revolution from beginning to end. So for them to differentiate, you know, they just throw in, oh, 1776 was a counter-revolution against the British Empire. It was a counter-revolution, you know, neo-progressives, that is new left neo-progressives say 1776 was a counter-revolution against the British Empire. It was a counter-revolution to preserve slavery. And the Constitution basically by putting in place the Senate and the Electoral College, it created a slaveholders republic and this kind of thing. That's what they say. But they don't differentiate. They say it's all, it's turtles the whole way down. It's white supremacy and slave hold, the slave power the whole way down. The old progressives used to differentiate. And I object to this differentiation because the Constitution is the culmination of the American Revolution. Why do I say that? Well, because effectively, it's going to sound wild, but, but it's nevertheless true. In the 1760s and 1770s, in the moment of kind of revolutionary fervor and turbulence to overthrow the British Empire, there was a sense in which there was this distant sovereignty in London, the Crown and Parliament, which the colonists had previously been willing to accept because they coordinated with their colonial assemblies, meaning the, the government of the colonies was done in, through a coordination between the colonial assemblies, which were based on a wide franchise and a great deal of participation and a very participatory civil society, newspapers, public sphere, free association, free press, free assembly, all of that. The belief was that they were willing to work with that distant sovereignty. But when that distant sovereignty created military and bureaucratic structures that were unaccountable to the society it ruled and began to dis displace colonial civil society. When that happened, they sort of ran in the other direction. I'm being very, very crude, Addison, but they ran in the other direction and they said local rule, local government. So in the period of the later 1770s and 1780s, you got extremely small d democratic political orders, right? Unichamber uni uh, uh, legislatures, right? Uh, unicameral legislatures, no bicameral legislatures, but unicameral legislatures. And the only one branch of government, because those legislatures often appointed the judges and they appointed the, the executive, right? And you got the Articles of Confederation, which was an extremely weak government that didn't have tax power, that didn't have military power, all of these kinds of things. Why did the American revolutionaries initially go towards these extremely democratic forms of government? Again, if you look at the period roughly from 1775, 76, through to about the later 1780s, Internally, you have these highly democratic forms of government in the independent states. Many of them did not create three separate branches of government, but one branch of government, a legislature that appointed the judges and the governors. So the executive and the judicial flowed out of the legislature. The legislature often didn't have two branches. It only had one branch. And furthermore, it was based on a very wide electorate and wide vote, most adult males. And that included free whites and free blacks, by the way, contra uh, 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 the, 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 the Tawny decision. Dred Scott, the Tawney decision. Roger Tawney, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Dred Scott decision on the eve of the Civil War just lies. He fabricates American history. He says citizenship was always tied to free whites. That's not true at all. It was tied to free males and it had no skin color tie. It wasn't until the 1820s and 30s in the age of Jackson that they began tying full civil rights to, to whiteness that, that was restricted to adult white males. There had been free blacks in the colonies and in the early Republican period. Anyway, sorry, I'm babbling. I have a tendency to do this. But, but that being said, they had gone to these incredibly internal democratic structures. And then they had created this very democratic Articles of Confederation, right? Very loosely confederated. And um, there was a huge problem with that, which is uh, essentially they risked a return towards a kind of political democracy through elections and be serving in a legislature as opposed to a social democracy. A, by that, I don't mean socialism. By social democracy, I mean democracy of society of everyday life, a democracy of civil society. That was their goal, the democracy of civil society that come into existence in the colonies. And suddenly you were getting all of these incredibly democratic legislatures and all of these, this loose articles confederation, and they were interfering in a great deal of things. They were interfering in 
property rights. They were threatening to cancel debts. They were threatening to cancel loans states had taken on. They were doing all of these kinds of things that basically were reinforcing political liberty. The idea that you, you know, could vote for a legislature and, or you could be a legislature and then you could determine society as opposed to what the revolutionaries were aiming for at the beginning. What Thomas Paine said he's aiming for in common sense, what the Abbe Renault says he's aiming for in answering the Academy of Lyon, which is social liberty, social democracy, social freedom, freedom in society, not political liberty, but social liberty, organized social liberty, civil liberty. They wanted civil liberty over political liberty, and they began to realize that this po these political structures they were creating were interfering with civil, civil liberty, canceling debts, loans. Let me give you a great example of this. I know I'm babbling, but, but one second. Are you from, have you ever heard of the um, Shades Rebellion? Okay, so it, it takes place amongst uh, former American revolutionary veterans who are essentially farmers in central and western Massachusetts, basically Massachusetts outside of the Boston area. And these farmers in central and western Massachusetts do not like an excise tax. An excise tax is a regressive tax on sales, as opposed to progressive tax on income. They don't like the excise tax, which affects them and the products of their land heavily, okay? That excise tax had been voted in by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts right, through free and liberal and democratic procedures. Those American Revolutionary veterans and farmers decided to take up arms and to overthrow the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or to attempt to defeat this tax. So you have people taking up arms against the constitutional, open, liberal, democratic procedures of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And then a bunch of elites in the country, and this is not the people who created the convention of 1787, Right, a bunch of elites, wealthy planters, merchants, lawyers, got really worried about this overthrow of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So they began countenancing the funding of a private army that would put this down because there weren't enough resources. The Articles of Confederacy, the Confederacy didn't have the resources, didn't have a standing army to put this, this rebellion down. So you had a faction of farmers trying to overthrow the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and then you had a faction of continental American elites trying to create a private army to put this down. The, found, the people who became the founders, meaning the people who decide to go to Philadelphia and to get rid of the Articles of Confederation and to draft a new constitution, they did this for a lot of reasons. They did this because political liberty was interfering in civil liberty. They did this because the, 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 the unicameral legislatures were interfering in the civil rights of people. They did this because commerce and finance and, and economic relations were being undermined and the market and division of labor was being undermined. They did this because there was a weak national government that couldn't raise an army, it couldn't raise taxes, it had all of these problems, right? But the immediate trigger was Shays Rebellion where this nightmare came to line that a small faction could overturn the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and then a private army could be raised. So the so-called counter-revolutionary elites that gathered in Philadelphia, they gathered in Philadelphia because they were concerned about elites that might raise private armies to do their own things, right? They were actually worried about public uh, factions, right, riots, and then private armies, private factions, and, and a kind of state of nature, war of all against all, a, re, you know, a, a dissolution of government, a return not to society, but almost a war of all against all. So that was a trigger to go and do the Constitution. And when they go and sit, Addison, in 1787, they know immediately, they, they, they go there because all of the 13 state governments elect them to go there. They say, you can go to Philadelphia as our representative. They go there and here's where the coup, the coup view, the progressive view that was counter-revolution has an empirical point, otherwise it has none. They go there and they say, we're not gonna rewrite the Articles of Confederation. We're gonna create something totally new. They create a constitution, right? But they create a highly liberal democratic structure. It is novel for three reasons. One, they rigorously separate out legislative, judicial, and executive power and put them in balance against one another. And they deliberately designed that. You can read the best collections we have are James Madison and also James Wilson, uh, one of the uh, first associate justices of the Supreme Court, then a, a representative from Pennsylvania to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. You look at Madison and Wilson's papers. They deliberately designed these three branches to be counterposed to one another to compete for, the, the, to appeal to public opinion and to society, right? And to be competing branches of government. Furthermore, they make every office holder in this, they, they create two branches of government, state and federal. So they've got multiple branches of government. They have state and federal branches of government. 
And they have three branches of the federal government, legislative, judicial, and executive. So the state and federal governments are competing with one another in the constitutional order for public opinion, for the general will of society. And then in the federal government, the judicial, the Supreme Court, the legislative, the Congress, House of Representatives and Senate, and the executive, the presidency, are competing one another for the public, for the general will of society. And every office holder in the federal level, in the federal legislative, executive, and judicial branch, is either elected or appointed by those who are accountable to the electorate. So the House of Representatives elected every two years on the greatest democratic franchise that existed in the 18th century prior to the French Revolution. Okay, uh, the, the Senate is to be elected by state legislatures at that time, right? To send senators to the upper chamber. The president is not directly elected, but it's elected, ele an electoral college is elected, but the electoral college is elected. So the president is indirectly accountable to the electorate through the electoral college. And the, 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 the um, Supreme Court is appointed by the president, approved by the Senate. And the president and the Senate are indirectly accountable to the electorate through the state legislatures that appoint the federal senators and through the president that is elected by the electoral college that is elected by the population. Right? They do all of this, but they link it all back to either they make them all elected office holders or they make them all appointed office holders accountable to the electorate. The third innovation this is, it was told in ancient and pre-modern political theory that you couldn't have a republic that stretched over a great territory. That's what ancient political theory said. All political, no, sorry, scratch that, Addison. All political theory prior to Montesquieu, so up to and including Montesquieu, the early 18th century said, you no, no, scratch that again. Up to Rousseau said you could not have a republic over a great extent of territory. Even with Rousseau, or even with the dawn of the radical enlightenment, there's a great deal of skepticism about having a democratic republic over a great extent of territory. The great innovation of the founders, right, is that you can have a democratic republic over a great extent of territory, right? That, that by having a federal union in organizing it the way they do, right? And their great insight is actually the freedom of society is better served, right? By a vast expanse of territory, which includes many factions and many interests. And if you have a vast society, if you have a vast organized society or civil society, you will have many factions and interests competing in it. And if you have a political order, right, with all these checks and balances between the state and the federal level and within the federal level between the Congress, the judiciary, and the executive, no faction or interest will be able to control this. But rather, they'll be in a free competitive situation, which Kant would later, you know, call, or Kant calls almost, no, right around this time, unsocial sociability. This will maximize in the vision of the, the founding fathers, in the vision of people like James Wilson and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, this will maximize unsocial sociability. This will maximize the free play of the invisible hand. The greater the, the expanse of territory you have, the greater society you have, the wider expanse of the organized civil society you have, the more interests and factions competing, they're not able to get control of all these branches of government at loggerheads with one another, state and federal, and within the federal executive, judicial, and legislative, and therefore you will have a kind of free play of private interests, right? And so in this sense, the Constitution is meant to create an extraordinary law, a fundamental law, with, which then allows for regular ordinary law to be created, meaning this is fundamental, guys. The Constitution creates fundamental law, extraordinary law. And it, it, it says, here's a framework of government, federal and state government, and within federal government, executive, legislative, judiciary. And what that means is that it's creating the ability to have ordinary law, the legislature. But the legislature can only create and therefore change ordinary law. It can never change the extraordinary law. The extraordinary law is the written constitution, the institutionalized general will of society. And a temporary legislature can only create ordinary law. It can never create extraordinary law, right? You have to change the constitution to change extraordinary law. Why do they do that? 
They do that because their view is very, very clearly, these are the people, you know, we were in the debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, we call them the Federalists or the Founders or the Founding Fathers, whatever you prefer to call them, right? What they do is they essentially, um, they do not want, right? They want to create a social order in which the freedom of each is the basis for the freedom of all. The freedom of all is the basis for the freedom of each. So it has to be a social order where there is a certain degree of democratic majoritarianism, but that democratic majoritarianism can only be in ordinary law, meaning in the kind of common rules and regulations that allow for a free civil society to develop on its own. You know, how do you build turnpikes? How do you build canals? How do you have education? All that kind of stuff. But there has to be a fundamental law which protects each person as an individual. That says even if a democratic majority of 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
progressive judges to be able to do what progressives can't get legislators to do. That is, whenever progressive Democrats can't get a majority of legislatures, they'll appoint progressive judges who will just decide based on whatever the whim of the progressive Democratic Party is that day what the Constitution means. And therefore, they can change the law, if that, if that makes sense. So I would say that we have to defend the Constitution as a fundamental part of the experience of the American Revolution, right? And um, that doesn't mean, of course, that the Constitution is a once and for all straitjacket. It changes, it amends, it transforms. Um, I think there can be, just within everyday liberal politics, that is, forget about socialist politics and much less Marxism, within everyday liberal politics, it's still possible to reform the Constitution, right? If people really think, right, that there shouldn't be a right to gun ownership, a Second Amendment, then they should try and change it. They should try and persuade their fellow citizens to change the extraordinary law of the, Constitu of the Constitution, which is the Second Amendment to the Constitution. If they can't do that, then it should remain. Right? And of course, I agree with rights to gun ownership as a, attached to the right of revolution, the right of self-defense. But nevertheless, like the Constitution is transformable. That being said, um, I think the Constitution absolutely needs to be defended because um, it's, it's connected to the American Revolution and the Constitution does not anywhere, anywhere, talk about ethnic or um, uh, racial or religious or national origins qualifications for anything in it. It is the first document, written document, of social and political order that makes no reference to human beings living in the world, men and women living together in the world by accidents of their birth and circumstances. And as the great Republican and abolitionist Frederick Douglass pointed out, and, and I would recommend all of you, because he can do a much better service to the Constitution I can, to go read the speech he gave in Scotland before an abolition in society called Is the US Constitution a Pro-Slavery and Anti-Slavery Document, where he makes clear it's an anti-slavery document. And he points out the word slave and slavery do not appear once. The word slave and slavery do not appear once in the Constitution. They make reference to unfree peoples, which includes both slavery and um, indentured servants, right? Because there are a lot of indentured servants around still. So people put themselves in temporary bondage <coughs> that are usually European immigrants, right? Um, that that is the only thing that um, it makes reference to. It does not include slavery in the document, right? It does not include, it certainly does not eliminate slavery, but it does not recognize slavery in the document. And Douglas is well aware he recovers on the eve of the Civil War, the original radical American founding, which is precisely to keep slavery out of the document. Because it is their hope that in creating a federal union, and this is really important. I know I've gone on too long, Edison, to response to your question, but their hope in creating such a federal union across the vast expense of territory. Remember, nobody up through, nobody from Plato and Aristotle up through Montesquieu and Rousseau thought you could have a democratic republic over a vast expanse of territory. They say you can because you want as expansive a free society and a civil society as possible. So you maximize competition, factions, and interests. You maximize the free play of private interests and individuals. You maximize unsocial sociability. And you create a government of many checks and balances to make sure branches are constantly at competition with one another to appeal to the general will of society. Their view, if you create a vast democratic republic, if you create a vast federal union, you will essentially encompass the areas of slave labor within free labor. And remember, in the very same year they meet to create the Constitution in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance is passed. And that set guarantees that all lands in the Ohio River Territory, Ohio Valley, Te Valley Territory, will be free labor. And so the idea they have is you continue to expand free labor. And as you expand free labor, slave labor, slave plantation will become islands within free labor and b redact back on the slave plantations to eventually free their slaves and participate in this greater world of free labor. That's the vision they set out. That is in creating this constitution and creating this much wider federal public, they're intending to expand the dynamics of unsocial sociability, of civil society, of free labor, of to increasingly isolate slave labor, and also to create better relations with indigenous people by having a strong federal government, which will allow, they hope in their ideals, and George Washington and his first Secretary of uh, uh, War, Henry Knox, say this explicitly, they hope that the federal union will be able, once the national government is launched, Knox and Washington begin meeting with indigenous leaders in Philadelphia, or sorry, in New York, then in Philadelphia, the first capitals before DC, 
to, to talk about how you might, that the U.S. may be able to continue to expand west and incorporate indigenous people through settled farming and commerce, manufacturing, art, craftsmanship, artisanship into the expanding republic. So the vision they lay out in the Constitution is also important to defend. The stuff that's not in the documents, but is there when they're writing it in 1787, and when it's, it's there in the debates as they ratify it in 1787 and 88, and it's there when the new government is launched in 1789. I mean, Washington and Knox letters talk about this all the time. The idea is to create this whole empire of liberty, this empire of free labor, right, that basically makes slave plantation, slave labor kind of backward islands that will eventually freely come over to the world of free labor and expands free labor through free cooperation with indigenous people. Right? And, and there's some sense in which that's actually true at the time, meaning plantation slavery was extremely important in colonial British North America in uh, uh, the late 17th century, but by the American Revolution, plantation slavery is actually less important in the profile of uh, the American economy overall. So when the United States emerges as a country, for 100 years, slavery has gone from being very important to less and less important. And free labor has driven the growth of the population from 200,000 to about 2, 3 million. Right, and an immense dynamic growth. And they can just imagine that will continue as bourgeois social relations expand, as the empire of liberty expands, as free labor expands. Basically, this massive demographic and socioeconomic growth will happen and slavery will freely end itself in the, in the states where it exists on the Eastern seaboard. And uh, you'll have cooperation of the indigenous people. What they don't see coming is the industrial revolution and capitalism and the rendering of bourgeois labor bourgeois freedom in crisis and contradiction with itself. The rendering of bourgeois free labor, of the exchange of free labor and its products, uh, increasingly unnecessary. The rendering of free labor increasingly, uh, free labor increasingly becomes surplus to itself. Free labor is increasingly rendered expendable. And that whole crisis and contradiction of bourgeois society that takes place with the proletarianization of society, that takes place with the Industrial Revolution, renders bourgeois labor right, um, expendable, renders free labor expendable, and sets that whole empire of liberty of free labor into crisis. Right? And over time, it's going to start to become an empire of unfree labor, of slavery as they seek to expand. But, but I, the reason why I would defend the American Revolution, the Constitution within it, is ultimately the slave power thought to get what they wanted at the end of the day they ultimately came to recognize that the documents of the American Revolution from Jefferson's and, and written and Second Continental Congress approved Declaration of Independence all the way to the Constitution, they came to recognize those documents were fetters on the empire of slavery, on the slave power, on the empire of unfree labor, and they had to break the chains of those fetters and create the Second Confederacy, right? They, they said that explicitly. And if anybody should doubt me, either you know here or in the wider audience that listens to this eventually, um, you simply can read the um, uh, Alexander Hamilton Stevens. Anybody knows this? The, the the leaders of the Confederacy, or what I like to call the Second Confederacy, because it was based on a kind of notion of states' rights that was already. Does everybody get like there was already that notion of states' rights in the Articles of Confederacy, right? Um, that was the first Confederacy. When the Constitution is ratified, it, it's precisely ratified to overcome that notion of states' rights, right? And the Second Confederacy wants to return to that notion of states' rights. And it's in, uh, 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 the leaders of the Confederacy are unfortunately called Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, sorry, Thomas Adams, sorry, Thomas Jefferson Davis, right, from Mississippi, and um, Alexander Hamilton Stevens from Georgia. Alexander Hamilton Stevens, Thomas Jefferson Davis, they're named after founders, but read what they say. They say explicitly they have to overturn the thinking and the men of the old declaration, the old constitution. Why? Because as Alexander Stevens, Alexander Hamilton Stevens says, I can't remember if it's called the foundation stone speech or the fire Corner, stone. Cornerstone speech. Cornerstone speech. He lays out clearly, we live in a new modern age of science and there is subspeciation, meaning we're not one humanity capable of living and benefiting in one society together. We're subspecies. And therefore, there has to be different laws and regulations that apply to these subspecies. And so some are fit for slavery and some are fit for freedom, right? There can't be one society. And, and he says Jefferson lives in a pre-scientific, pre-modern age of airy enlightenment abstractions, Thomas Jefferson, 
right? And they also, as, 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 as Douglas will point out, they will eventually come against the Constitution because the Constitution, right, um, is not a document for slavery, right? It, it's a document if properly exercised as Lincoln is prepared to do once he wins election in 1860, right? Uh, and stop the expansion, because Lincoln says explicitly, all he's doing is returning to the founding. The founders did not want slavery to expand one inch more. And he recognizes that the founding was undone by the Industrial Revolution, by the rise of the Cotton Kingdom in the South, the Deep South, the expansion of the Eastern Seaboard Old South and the Deep New South all the way to Texas, and the creation of the, the gr much greater slave power, and with it, the expansion of slavery West and the empire of slavery. And Lincoln says he wants to return to the notion of the founders, which is to hem slavery in by um, basically, uh, essentially, winning election and not letting it expand one inch further west. He says it won't go one fur further inch west, and he think thinks if it can't expand west, it will be blocked and retarded, and eventually, within a generation or two, it will be free in the areas where it exists. That's why he says, I won't touch slavery where it exists, but I won't let it expand one inch further west. It's a return, and that's a return to the original sensibility that informed the Constitution. I think all of that uh, 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 needs to be defended, right? That doesn't mean that you're defending a straitjacket. It doesn't mean that you need to live in the world of 1776 or 1787 or 1788, right? It, it means that you need to recover the kind of radical ideals of bourgeois society to think why they failed to achieve themselves, how they've basically in, in bringing about a practical purchase on the world, they've become in contradiction with themselves, self-undermining, and created a society that is fundamentally a society of the 19th century, of the industrial forces of production, where we nevertheless think in 18th century terms, right, in, 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 in the categories of, of the 18th century, of, 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 of bourgeois society at its height, right, that world of the capitalist contradiction, of bourgeois social relations of production, and con in, contradiction with the industrial forces of production. But, 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 but we won't, there's no way we can abandon that vision of society. We just, we must hold to that vision of society and in holding to it, you know, realize in some degree it's inadequate to the task of the contemporary world. But in trying to fulfill it, right, coming practically to realize its inadequacy, this inadequacy gripping the masses organized to try and realize it practically and to try and achieve it practically, realize the limitations of it practically, and to try and go beyond it practically, right? With theory and practice, with intellectuals and workers working together to, to both come to the, in attempting to achieve this notion of society, to come together practically to its limits and then to think through and collectively try and overcome and transcend those limits, if that makes sense. So I would defend the Constitution and all of that. What's your name? Yeah. Desmond, or I'm sorry, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Anais. Anais, do you have any questions? No? You guys no, have been kind know. enough. I, I, I mean, babbled I on too long. Yeah, it's, it's been too long. I, I don't want to take the events. <laughs> okay. Go even okay. <laughs> Anais, do you have any questions? No. Okay, okay. Thank you guys for your yeah, time. Thanks for your time.